felt like I had gone down for the last time My ways would be the death of me Watching Paul, they said it's all over now Then two open arms reach down Two open arms reaching for me Way beyond the reach of myself I'm rejected many times, oh but I need them now Those two open arms reaching down Viewed by some like trash that no one needs anymore But a treasure that someone else is looking for Jesus found me and he loved me as I was With his two open arms reaching down Two open arms reaching for me Way beyond the reach Myself. I reject it many times, oh, but I need them now. Those two open arms reaching down. Those two open arms reaching down. When I look around and see the good things he does for me all right good evening good evening good. how y'all are as they yeah, say good some parts of the states here he is fine amen in your uh your notes for tonight you have a copy um you have session one notes from last week, being we met virtually, and uh, that's the first page. The second page is this chart that was in the body of the um, notes last week, so it's full size, so folks like me can read it. <laughs> and and uh, the last page of your uh, outline there is actually tonight's lesson, which is session two of the predictive principle so well friends what great salvation we have mm -hmm. amen amen you know we'll see from uh, these uh, prophecies these many prophecies that the you know the lord uses uh, his prophets to foretell and foretell many things and uh, most of all let's tonight be like the greek proselytes who came to philip on the uh, at the last feast of the unleavened bread prior to uh, the lord's crucifixion Let's be like them uh, as we read John 12, 20 and 21. And there came, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, yeah. we would see Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So let's see the Lord in, in uh, our study tonight and see, uh, see him in the prophecies here. <clears throat> so a um, little bit of a review from last week. There's two types of prophecy. The first is speaking forth the Word of God, and for us, you know, just yeah. preaching, teaching, uh, talking about, providing witness of God's Word when we're dealing with somebody or, or a group of people. And then secondly, speaking forth the Word of God, which has to do with the future, predictive prophecy. And that's all found right here. Yeah. Okay. So ever since we received... Uh, the New Testament, the Bible, and uh, the apostles died out. There's no more prophets. There's no more tongues. There's no more gifts of healing. Right. There's none of those signs. Yeah. Um, the Bible says the Jews require a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. And, and signs are not for them to believe, but for them to believe not, the Scripture says. So we have to be very careful when it comes to uh, prophecy and signs and thinking that, that we still have those gifts today. So, there are seven subjects of prophecy, as you can see in your notes. Uh, first of all, there's things that occurred in the, the prophet's own day that the prophet was making exhortations about uh, by the Lord through, uh, through his prophets. 
basically to repent of uh, disobedience, uh, backsliding, idolatry, and spiritual adultery. Secondly, um, the second subject of prophecy is the 70 year uh, captivity that was going to come. Of course, first to uh, Israel, but then later on to Judah, which is our focus. Uh, beginning with the destruction of Jerusalem and carrying away the children of Israel in the temple accoutrements to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. So a couple of verses on that, Jeremiah 25, 11, which says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall, shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And Daniel 9, 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So he's after the time of Jeremiah. He's reading the word of God. He's reading the book of Jeremiah. So thirdly, you have the restoration of Israel. Their return to, to Israel, to the land of Israel under Cyrus uh, the king. Isaiah prophesied, this is interesting, Isaiah prophesied 60 years before Jeremiah, okay? During the reign of the reign of uh, kings Uzziah to King Hezekiah, that's basically 767 to 687 BC, and 130 years later, that's when Cyrus begins to reign. So Jeremiah named him. The Lord named him through Jeremiah. 137 years later, here's Cyrus the king. Okay, and uh, he's the founder of the first Persian Empire, and he reigned from 550 to 530 BC. Now the Lord used Isaiah to prophesy uh, Cyrus's name and that he would move King Cyrus to command the Jews to return to and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple as we read in Isaiah 44, verses 21 and 28. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee, thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. Thus that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, this is verse 28, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundations shall be laid. Okay. And in Isaiah 45, 1 and 3, thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leafed gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden ridges of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. This is 137 years before this comes to place, comes to pass. So Jeremiah also prophesied that the Jews returned to Judah after the seven year captivity in Jeremiah 29 10. For the Bible says, For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work towards you in causing you to return to this place. <clears throat> and finally, Ezra records Cyrus's decree fulfilling Isaiah and Jeremiah's prophecy uh, in Ezra 6.3. In the first year of Cyrus the king, notice this, the first year of his reign, this is the first Persian king. In the first year, the, uh, the king, the same Cyrus, the king, made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be built, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid. The height thereof, three score cubits. Now that's 60 cubits, which is essentially 90 feet, I think. And the breadth thereof, three score cubits, which is 60, uh, again, uh, 60 cubits or 90 feet. So 90 feet cube. So fourthly, the Lord Jesus Christ's first advent, that's the fourth of the seven topics of prophecy. His birth, ministry, betrayal, crucifixion, and ascension, and other things, as we'll uh, list here. Again, this is all Old Testament prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we get into later, it's essential there's certain characteristics of true prophecy, and these verses meet all those characteristics. Micah 5, 2, the, speaking of his birth, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been of old, 
from everlasting. So that's God that's going to come and be the ruler over Israel. So the introduction to Israel via John the Baptist is spoken of in Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make, his, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The youth, in, uh, the youth of the Lord Jesus Christ and his revelation to Israel is discussed, is prophesied in Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Speaking of his ministry in Isaiah 42, 1 to 4, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. <clears throat> a bruised reed shall he not break. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. This is this covers a long period of time here. When you're talking about the Lord's ministry, you have a two thousand year gap uh, to to verse four, where he uh, sets judgment in the earth, and the isles wait for his law. So his betrayal uh, is foretold in Psalm 41, 9. Yea, my own familiar friend, speaking of Judas, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, remember the sop, at dinner, hath lifted up his heel against me. What was the price of his betrayal in the potter, potter's, potter's field uh, purchase? It's foretold in Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. Then I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord, which uh, Judas did, and they bought the potter's field with it where they buried poor people. So he was forsaken by his disciples, as foretold in Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Now, kind of depending on you to remember in the New Testament where these are fulfilled. I should have written that down for you. I apologize for that. But... Uh, Gives you a little research project. <clears throat> Gives you work to do. So the crucifixion. Several verses here. Psalm 22, 1. Psalm 22, verses 6 to 8. And Psalm 22, 16 to 18. To the chief musician upon Ahijaleth Shahar, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The words of the Lord from the cross. Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring... But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Remember the serpent that was held up on the pole that people had to look at by Moses in order for them to be healed from the serpent's, serpent's bite? That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's on the pole? A serpent. What's a serpent like? A worm. Okay. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Those exact words were spoken to the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Those dogs, I think, are not only the Gentiles that are there, but also the devils mm. that were there at that time. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture, which the, which the soldiers did because it was made of one piece, right? Psalm 69, 21. <clears throat> they gave me also gall for my meat. Remember when he first went on the cross? They used gall as a um, painkiller, but he wouldn't receive it. Right. Okay. He, he was going to suffer the pain that um, for you and I on yes. the cross. He was going to suffer that pain. Yes. He wasn't going to have it numb at all. 
Um, and in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink when he was on the cross. And he said, I thirst. What did they put on a sponge and put to his lips? And when he tasted thereof, he did what? He gave up the ghost. My, my father, into, my, into thy hands I come in my spirit. Right. Zechariah 13, 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Isn't it marvelous? having these prophecies hundreds of years before the Lord came and then being fulfilled to the letter mm -hmm. while he was on earth. Amen. It's marvelous. Mm -hmm. How can we not believe this book? Yes. It's Amen. a divine book. Amen. Isaiah 53, verses uh, 3 to 9. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Yeah. <clears throat> he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yeah. Amen. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Remember before the high priests? He, buried, he didn't say anything until they adjured him. Are you the Son of God? The Son of the Blessed? Yeah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is done, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, two thieves on the cross, and with the rich in his death. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich person, had his own grave. Uh, his own tomb that nobody had ever laid in, provided his tomb, but for a few days. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Interesting. Here's a verse, Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. He made intercession for the transgressors, those people that crucified him. Daniel 9.26, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. <coughs> Excuse me. but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and under the end of the war desolations are determined. So this is speaking of the Lord's crucifixion and then uh, Daniel, Daniel's 70th week afterwards. His descent into paradise, preaching to the souls there uh, and in hell and bringing the Old Testament souls to heaven. Psalm 68, 18. Thou hast ascended on high, there's his ascension, Thou hast led captivity captive, that's taken the, the saved in paradise for which the sacrifice hadn't been made yet, so their sins were not washed away, they were just forgiven, so now they could leave paradise. You had Abraham's bosom, you had Lazarus there, you had everybody from Abel that was saved all the way up to uh, the day that the Lord Jesus Christ died, that's where they went. Um, 
Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he, the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Not just captives of sin, but those people were captive in paradise as well. They could not leave. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So he opened that prison. There's his resurrection. Psalm 16:10. For thou wilt not lead my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. There's a double meaning there. You have David, who's not going to stay in hell or paradise. Hell was divided into two compartments. You had the burning side, and then you had the paradise side. Okay, that's how Lazarus, the rich man saw Lazarus, and vice versa, and the rich man saw Abraham. Okay, I think that's, I want to say it's Luke 16. I want to say that's right. Um, Psalm 20, verse 6. Now I know that the Lord saveth his anointed. That's speaking of the Lord. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Psalm 71, 20. Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles shalt quicken me again and shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Again, dual meaning there. This is David prophesying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jonah 1.17 now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Remember, the Lord said, as Jonah was, there's no, going to be no sign that this adult, uh, given to this generation except that of the prophet Jonah, how that he was three days and three nights in the heart of the belly, so the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, and his ascension, Psalm 68, 18, Thou hast ascended up upon high, thou hast led captivity captive. We already read this, but with a different emphasis. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. So point number five, the Jews' uh, worldwide dispersion. These are prophecies concerning that. Ezekiel, remember there's seven things. This is number five. Yet will I leave a remnant, that ye may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations, when ye shall be scattered through the countries. I think we, in a previous study, we listed where the population of the Jews are around the world. And the majority of them are right here in the good old USA. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. More Jews here than in Israel. Yeah. Jeremiah 20, uh, 20 verse 18, And I will persecute them with the sword, with the famine, with pestilence, and will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and an astonishment and a an hissing and a reproach among all nations, whither I have driven them. And that's true. I mean, you talk about a people that are persecuted and hated for many, many reasons. That's right. Because God blesses them and, you know, prospers them. And then people get envious and they start blaming the Jews for their troubles. Yep. A.K.A. Adolf Hitler and a lot of people everywhere blaming the Jews for their problems. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it is. How is that? Okay, Ezekiel uh, 36, 24 to 28. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. That's yet to happen. Ezekiel 37, 14, And I shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. It's amazing how it keeps going back to the land, right? Big fight over the land over there. They don't, Israel today does not possess all their land. They will one day. Amos 9, 9. For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. He's got full accountability of his people. Okay. Micah 5, 7 and 8. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waited for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, 
as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Okay. Topic number six, the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble, at the end of the times of the Gentiles. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Daniel 12, 1. And at the time... And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Zephaniah 1 verses 14 and 15. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wastedness, a wasteness and uh, desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So that's the tribulation. And lastly, the kingdom. The second advent, or the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ at the end of the great tribulation. <coughs> Numbers 24, 17 I shall see him, but not now I shall behold him, but not now There shall come a star out of Jacob And a scepter A star is capitalized And scepter is capitalized Shall rise out of Israel And shall smite the corners of Moab And destroy all the children of Sheth Psalm 24, 7 to 10 Lift up your heads, O ye gates And be ye lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. It's one of my favorite passages. Mm -hmm. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King, capital K, of glory, Selah. Psalm 86, 9, All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It's going to be a great day. And when you get time, read the entire chapter of Isaiah 11. Uh, it's all about this. Uh, Isaiah 49, verses 6 to 7, and he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserve of Israel. I also will give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord that is faithful, and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Daniel 2.44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So in the end, there's only to be one kingdom, right? Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Zechariah 12.10, And I will pour upon the house of David and look upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and 
and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Can you imagine the nation of Israel coming to the realization when they do that they crucified their Messiah? Imagine that. What would that do to... I mean, we all have a part in the Lord being crucified, amen. But to have been promised the Messiah and to have looked for the Messiah and to have missed him mm. as a nation. Mm. Zechariah 14, 1 to 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Remember the Lord said, if you're in the if you're in the housetop, don't go down and gather up anything. If you're in the field, you know, flee. This is that time I'm speaking of. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight for the nations as when <clears throat> fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. That's three and a half years later. Okay? And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in, the de in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea, and half of them towards the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. And finally, Micah 4, 1 and 2. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountains, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now that's about at least a dozen verses on prophecies concerning uh, the kingdom. Okay, so how many how many prophecies are there in the Bible? Well, one author, Dr. John F. Walvoord, I think he's Dutch. Uh, he was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary for over 50 years. He published a book in 1990 entitled "Every Prophecy of the Bible: Clear Explanations for Uncertain Times." He doesn't go into a great deal of depth in this book, but he examined over a thousand passages of key prophecies in the Bible, of which he explains that over 500 of them were, uh, have already been fulfilled. What do you think of that? Half of them are yet to be fulfilled. Uh, it's important in that these are verifiable events in history, okay, which leads us uh, into the following notes by AT, uh, Dr. A.T. Pearson, which we'll go over. I'd like you to listen to this. Uh, it's part of the introduction from Dr. Uh, Walford's introduction to his book. Uh, he provides a historical backdrop talking about how everything used to be interpreted literally and then in Alexandria it kind of went allegorically and then it came back to uh, literally and then, you know, in the late 1800s things started, you know, your amillennialists and Post-millennials came in and started spiritualizing everything again, and now you know there's a definitely a group of people who believe that prophecy is literal, okay, and that the Lord will do what He said He's yeah. going to do, just as He has in the past. Right. It's only think about it, it's only logical to think that, just from a humanistic standpoint. If all the, if half of the prophecies have been proved literally, come right. true literally, why wouldn't the other half? Right. Who said they changed? That's good. Man. It wasn't God. It was man. Mm -hmm. So he says the revelation of prophecy in Scripture serves as an important evidence that the Scriptures are accurate in their interpretation of the future. 
because approximately half of the prophecies of the Bible have already been fulfilled in a literal way, it gives a proper intellectual basis for assuming the prophecy yet to be fulfilled will likewise have a literal fulfillment. At the same time, it justifies the conclusion that the Bible is inspired of the Holy Spirit and that prophecy, which goes far beyond any schemes of man, is instead a revelation by God of that which is certain to come to pass. The fact that prophecy has been literally fulfilled serves as a guide to interpret prophecies that are yet ahead. Okay. So, uh, Dr. A.T. Pearson, he, he, had, uh, he had some notes from a lecture on the predictions in Scripture, <coughs> point B in your notes. Uh, first of all, the Bible points to prediction as an absolute proof that God is speaking. God makes that claim himself in that when he utters predictive statements, they can come from God and God alone. Okay, Isaiah 42, 9, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Okay, So God is telling us the future. That's what he's saying. And only he can do that. Isaiah 44, 6 to 8, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people? And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you, excuse me, told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Isaiah 45, 21. Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. And finally, Isaiah 46, 9 to 10. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Yes. The difference between an idol of man and God is that the heathen carries his God, whereas God carries his people. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. John 13, 19, the, the proof of the prophet is that the things that he utters are fulfilled, okay? The Lord said in John 13, 19, Now I tell you before it come that when it comes to pass, when it come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. He also said in John 14, 29, And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it come to pass, ye might believe. So the Lord was prophesying even on earth the events that were going to come uh, take place and what would happen and how his crucifixion, his form of death would be crucifixion, etc. And how he was going to be betrayed, etc. He told them this beforehand so that they would believe. Okay? And yet he had no control over those events. He was taken prisoner and led about. Okay? He wasn't out making sure things happened. He just told them what was going to happen. Secondly, the Lord challenges other religions to foretell future events. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22. The Lord God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, this is Moses speaking, whom unto him ye shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Orb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. So they didn't want to see God face to face anymore. They wanted that intermediary, Moses, to talk to God and Moses, and then uh, God to talk to Moses and then Moses to give them the message. They were so frightened. Okay? And the Lord said, They have well spoken. He said, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. All that I command him, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. 
But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, yeah. nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. Yes. That's right. But the prophet that hath, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So all these folks running around, you know, Jean Dixon, she's probably long dead and stuff. And, yeah. You know, Carl Sagan and Nostradamus and all these other vague uh, prophets, if you will, don't have to be afraid of them. Amen. Okay, they're not of God. It's only God that tells the future. Isaiah 41, 21, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they be, that we consider them, and know the latter end of them, or declare uh, us things <coughs> for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good, or do evil, that we may be dismayed, and behold it together. Behold, ye are of nothing, and your work of naught. An abomination is he that chooseth you. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun shall he call upon my name, and he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth clay. Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know, and before time that we may say he is righteous? Yea, there is none that showeth. Yea, there is none that declareth. Yea, there is none that heareth your words. The first shall say to Zion, Behold, behold them, and I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings. For I beheld, and there was no man, even among them, and there was no counselor that, when I asked of them, could answer a word. Behold, they are all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molten images are wind and confusion. Okay, speaking of idols and false prophets. Thirdly, the Bible is a book of prediction. Uh, first of all, there's so much prediction and fulfillment in the Bible that there can be no doubt about this book being the Word of God. Yeah. And secondly, the writings of other religious texts are obscure, and if they do make a prediction, it usually fails, and the defenders of it have to make excuses for such errors. That's right. Yeah, so how many people are going to be saved? 144,000? Oh, nope. <laughs> we got more than that now in our church, so we're going to have to change that. Okay. You don't get to go to heaven just 144,000, do everybody else gets to hear and hear. You know it's going to burn up, right? So, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so criteria by which to test prophecy. First of all, the remoteness of time. To ensure that one making the prophecy cannot influence or cause the fulfillment of their prophecy, the prophecy must be uttered sufficiently before the time of its fulfillment so that the prophet cannot make it come to pass through his own power. In other words, I make a, if I make a, predict, a prediction that uh, my good friend's going to get a bloody nose and then I go over there and I punch him in the nose and it bleeds, yeah. there's not enough time separation there. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's a pretty simplistic answer, but uh, you cannot affect it by your own power. Jer for example, Jeremiah 31, 15, Thus saith the Lord. These are examples that take place in the future that we know of, the, they were fulfilled, but as you listen to them, they were made hundreds of years before they happened. Jeremiah 31, 15, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rahul weeping for her children to be, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. That's when King Herod had all the children two years and older, under, uh, excuse me, slaughtered, yeah. because he thought he was going to get uh, the Messiah. Or uh, another, another uh, example, Micah 5, 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Yes. Where was, where was uh, Jesus' stepfather and Jesus' mother living when she conceived Jesus? Nazareth. What happened? The taxing slash census that took place? He had to go 
they had to go to Bethlehem. Why? It's the city of David. And they were of the house of David. So they had to go there to be taken account of. Okay? Bethlehem Ephratah. Amazing. So the minuteness of detail is the second thing. The particulars of the prophecy must be so many and so minute that there could be no possibility of shrewd guesswork for the accuracy of the fulfillment. No less than 33 prophecies were filled within several hours of the crucifixion. 33. Wow. So for example, Psalm 22, 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Another example, Psalm 69, 21, they gave me gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. We already went over that one. Thirdly, the novelty of combination. There should have been nothing in previous history which would make it possible to forecast a like event in the future. There must be something new, something fresh, something startling in the prediction and the method of its fulfillment to prove divine intervention, such as uh, Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Never before had there been a virgin birth. Right? Physically impossible. Or Isaiah 53, 9, And he made his grave with the wicked. Okay? He didn't choose to have two thieves crucified with him. It was foretold. Okay? And with his rich and his death, he had nothing to do with Joseph of Arimathea going and uh, offering his tomb and securing and begging his body. And then him and Nicodemus taking the Lord and put him in, in uh, Joseph of uh, tomb. And with the rich in his death, because he had no violence, he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Uh, another one, number four, point D. The mystery of contradiction. There should be something in the prophecy when examined carefully which is apparently contradictory and paradoxical, an apparent contradiction that makes it impossible to understand the prediction fully until history has supplied the key. For example, the ruler slash Messiah's crucifixion. Who could see that? Right. John 12, 34, the people answered, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever, and how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? See, they, they, didn't, they didn't have any concept that the Messiah would be crucified. Okay? And Micah 5, 2, But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is the ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. So finally, the clearness of forecast. There's no ambiguity. There's no cloudiness of statement. A clearness of forecast to make the meaning obvious. Okay? Isaiah 44, 28. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built into the, into the temple, thy foundations shall be laid. That was fulfilled in Ezra 6.3, 137 years to thereabouts, give it take, after the prediction was made. There was no ambiguity. There was no cloudiness of statement. This is going to happen. Cyrus is going to do this. And Cyrus <clears throat> did. He wasn't even a twinkle in his Great, 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 granddad's eye yet. <laughs> okay? When that prophecy was made. And another example, the Bible is replete and full of them. I mean, we, you can just go on days about this. 1 Kings 21, 23. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Yeah. And that was fulfilled in 2 Kings 9. Verses 30 to 37. All that was left of her was her hands, I think. Maybe her feet, I don't know. But her hands, that was all that was left. The dogs ate her. And then another scripture talks about her being dung. Yeah. Well, she got turned into dung, didn't she? When, yeah. After the dogs ate her. Not to be indelicate. But that is not 
That is not metaphorical. That is not <laughs> obtuse. Yeah, that, uh, that's pretty clear. Good work, your brother. Good work. <laughs> so those principles are just for us to consider yeah. about prophecy. So, just amazing. Yes. Just what an amazing God we have, first of all, but that he put it down in Scripture, and he had dozens of prophets, dozens of prophets, uh, give the word of God forth and make these yeah. uh, predictions, this predictive prophecy. should bless our heart. Yeah. Amen. It should encourage us that God keeps his promises. He keeps his word. When he makes a promise, he keeps it. When he gives a prophecy, he keeps it. There's none like him. There's none other than him. Amen. Okay, well, let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for showing yourself so plainly to us. And Lord, we, uh, we just ask that you help us to make it plain to others that uh, they may come to know you. And Lord, uh, we just we pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We ask that you protect them. Lord, cover them, we ask. And make our nation strong to help Ukraine and the nations around the world. And we pray that you'd uh, be with the sick that are among us that couldn't be here. Lord, we just we think of them often, pray for them often. We just pray that you raise them up and uh, they rejoice in you. Uh, we just pray that you be with us now as we travel home. Uh, may you be honored and glorified in all that we say and do in Jesus' name. Like I had gone down to the last time, my way would be the death of me. Watching Paul, they said it's all over now. 